So it's difficult to come across fan games that, having been through so much development hell, actually make it to a finalized state through persistence or just plain luck. Most often times you hear about somebody's fan game being cancelled, as is a running joke, with the vast majority of these FNAF tributes, likely due to inexperienced developers underestimating just how much time, effort, and teamwork needs to go into even the simplest of fan games. Other times the workload can just get too overwhelming, people might drop out of the team, things just might not go to plan. Working for free on a project as ambitious as a playable fan game can be pretty taxing. Pop Goes is one of those anomalies. What began as a fairly different experience early on in development turned into a pretty different fan game in a lot of areas, to the point where its developer, Kane Carter, refers to the game as either Pop Goes 2015 or 2016, depending on which point in development is being discussed. The dividing line? Around Christmas 2015. And after some fairly unfavorable road bumps along the way, Pop Goes finally pushed through and made its way to Game Jolt and released on June 26th, 2016. This is a fairly fascinating fan game to discuss, and not unlike my review of Five Nights at Candy's Remastered, albeit that technically an updated version of the same game, this is another re-review. Yeah, I kind of figured the video I pronounce epitome as epitome counts towards being one of my biggest sins, so hey, thought I'd give the game a second chance with a proper critical view this time, going over the game as a whole, and generally, you know, properly reviewing the thing. I was like 15 when I made that initial review, what do you expect, competence? But hey, we're here now, I'm ready to just review the piss out of this thing, so yeah, here we go. Before I truly dive in, I want to establish that there is a lot more to the story, history, and universe of Pop Goes than just the one fan game, spanning years of content. The playable teaser was even developed and published as its own spin-off game taking the form of an RPG a few months prior to release. But just for the sake of keeping this video at a reasonable length, I'll be avoiding anything that isn't just like the core fan game. Also, I should probably establish that Pop Goes alone has like a shit ton of lore, which I would not be throwing myself very far into. I want to focus more on the game as a whole rather than sit here spelling out the story to you. Alright? Cool? Yeah? Great? Awesome? It's Weasel Hours. So, Pop Goes opens up to a bit of an unexpected title screen, not your typical game logo, rather, Welcome to Weaselware. Uh, a little odd, but I figure it's some kind of prominent feature to the game or something. Anyway, game loads, and this is already particularly unique in terms of location. Well, not the building as a whole, rather, where you're situated specifically in the building. The building in question, the Pop Goes Pizzeria, named after the restaurant's titular character, Pop Goes the Weasel. Yeah, this fan game's got a bit of a thing for wordplay. Get used to it. Pop Goes takes place one year after Fazbear's Fright, and this fan game's a little unique in the fact that it branches off from the lore presented in Five Nights at Freddy's 3 and forms its own canon as a way to neatly tie up loose ends, only considering those first three Freddy's games. In other words, FNAF 4 and onwards aren't canon to the Pop Goes timeline. The second opening card before the title screen boots up makes that much clear. And canonically, the Pop Goes Pizzeria was built from the ground up with those original restaurants in mind, to the point where Pop Goes' hat is the very same that originally belongs to Freddy Fazbear, acquired from the post Fazbear's Fright auction by the owner of said pizzeria, a man who only goes by the name Fritz. Oh, so Fritz Smith, right? That's what I can only assume them to be, especially considering the game's strong resemblance to Five Nights at Freddy's 2 as a whole. The animatronic plastic shells, the general designs of said animatronics, they definitely take inspiration from 2's toy animatronics. The sleeker, more futuristic feel of the environment, the whole aura of this being the newer, safer, and more technologically advanced restaurant is fairly in line with the location in Freddy's 2. Even some of the Easter eggs and small plastic figures scattered about are just straight up toy animatronics. Oh, and speaking of Easter eggs, I must have gotten this one a fun time Foxy about four more times in comparison to like two other toy animatronic hallucinations. I get it's because she appears in the room you'll check pretty often, but uh I don't know, just thought that was kind of odd. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for the night segments, instead of an office to kick about in, you'll be sitting in front of one of the publicly accessible PCs for customers of the establishment to use during the day, in the primary dining area, and sure enough, the very animatronics you're tasked with stopping from ending your playthrough are in the immediate vicinity, right up there on the show stage. I really dig this concept, while this is pretty unusual, this establishes on the spot that this is unlike most fan games that draw the animatronics out to be like bloodthirsty killers by default or whatever, instead starting off with robots close by, almost as if the game is assuring you right there and then that they're not intent on making a beeline to you. Also, I find it kind of funny that the reason you're shoved in front of one of the internet cafe monitors and not given your own room is because the owner legitimately just couldn't scramble anything together for you in time. And besides, as he explains in one of the 
phone calls, he's already actually chilling over in his own office across the hall from you the entire time. Uh, very odd. <laughs> You'd assume that defeats the whole purpose of having a night watchman, right? You can swivel around 360 degrees with the Weasel and Squirrel animatronics, Pop goes and the Squirrel sisters, Sarah and Saffron respectively, propped up behind you. The Badger animatronic, Blake, sitting over on the far side of the restaurant to your left, and out the window to your right, the Crow character, Stone, fixed outside the window. And, uh, yeah, these guys are just chilling, man. It really doesn't seem like this game is as straightforward as animatronic bad right off the bat, you know. There's certainly got to be something more to this. As Fritz does explain to you in the calls, safety and transparency really are the restaurant's top priorities. And, as seems to be the case, the robots seem to abide by that policy for once. Also, yeah, as seems to be pretty commonplace by now, most fan games were greeted by a phone call at the beginning of each night from Fritz himself. Unlike a lot of the exposition dump phone messages, a lot of fan games seem to fall into the trap of, Fritz's calls are pretty engaging all throughout, and they're certainly quite well written. The mechanics aren't outright explained to you a lot of the time either. Explanations on how certain mechanics work and how animatronics behave are woven into stories. I think a good example is Fritz's retelling of watching a kid interact with Blake in the server room playing Simon Says, which is, you know, pretty much exactly what Blake's mechanic is, requiring you to read the color of the monitor on the camera, pressing the corresponding colors button on the desk, and calling him over to you to drag him out the room. One really cool feature with these phone calls is that at the end of each one, you're treated to one of three questions to ask the guy, a multiple choice kind of deal, which is an element of replay value I've never really seen any other fan game pull off. These cool segments are almost always just extra lines of dialogue that dabble a tad further into the background of Fritz and the restaurants. And while they're not like, you know, super insanely exciting additions to the game or whatever, you know, it's still cool to be able to replay a night and listen through an option you wouldn't have heard the first time around. It's definitely some neat little variation for replay value which uh, is definitely something you'll have to worry about to get all the endings here, more on that shortly. Oh, and speaking of the phone calls, we do get an explanation for what that Weaselware thing was on the menu, as explained by Fritz. Weaselware is an operating system, a game created by myself. It's a very simple, very nifty system. It links almost all of the machines in this place. If you have access to it, you can control almost every function of other things wirelessly. Cameras, vents, printers, even Pop goes himself. Ah, oh, okay. With that context, okay, yeah, the menu UI is pretty cool. It's like an extension of the in-universe Weaselware interface expanded upon to introduce us to the game itself. That's pretty neat. So to replace the typical tablet or monitor, at your disposal is said phone, allowing you total access to the building's various tools to prevent the animatronics from, well not reaching you, rather completing a task. It's a little unconventional and really not something you see much of in these fan games, so I appreciate the direction Kane's gone for here. Bob Goes the Weasel will wander into the restaurant's main lobby and will book a room at random to make use of its respective 3D printer. He's intent on printing various animatronic parts to build a black plastic replica of Toy Bonnie known as Black Rabbit. You'll have to put a stop to that by pushing the room shutdown button. Sarah and Saffron will make their way around to you via the linear ventilation system. You'll have to activate the laser heat beams on any given vent camera to prevent them from progressing further. Blake the Badger will get up and operate in the server room. You'll have to press the corresponding button on your desk to match the color that appears on the monitor, and then push the yellow button on your left to call them over to you. And finally, stun the crow. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you'll have likely have noticed the panic meter on the bottom left, and as established by the relatively harmless way the game presents these robots to you, they can't kill you, not by any conventional means anyway. Instead, they'll do their best to increase your panic level, with Stone the Crow's mechanic being the most obvious example of this. In order to reduce panic, you gotta look out the window every once in a while, but on occasion, this dickhead will, uh, yeah. Your panic will shoot right up, so you gotta flick back away from the window for a second. However, Sarah, Saffron, and Blake won't directly affect your panic meter. Rather, the squirrels will swipe your phone from you, and Blake will kill the connection, both outcomes resulting in the loss of the use of it, causing you to panic fairly quickly. And without a way to prevent the animatronics from making things worse, this will end your playthrough. Though, while those are the most obvious examples I can give, those aren't actually the only ways to increase panic. Making minor mistakes like shutting down the wrong room, heating up the wrong vents, pressing the button to call Blake over at the wrong time, even simply looking at the animatronics or clicking the cameras too quickly will all increase your panic by small increments. More cleverly, things like shutting down the room Pop goes as in just before he attempts to print an animatronic part, that'll also increase your panic a little too. According to the developer, a lot of these specific situations increase your meter to mimic that of these actually being stressful situations. After all, the act of having to keep tabs on all these different mechanics can become pretty challenging. And boy howdy, does this game get stressful at <laughs> Please! Pop goes works fairly differently to the previous games I've reviewed on this channel, mechanically anyway. Every mechanic in the game is built off of a 
legitimate functional asset in the restaurant. No strange ass power driven doors, no mask, no ridiculously unconventional methods of traversing from point A to point B. No, every mechanic he'll come across will have some kind of canonical purpose as a significant element to the restaurant in daylight hours, which is very cool. However, the way Kane's gone about implementing these means that none of the mechanics really play off of each other. At all. What I mean by this is that instead of utilizing one or two main defenses against a myriad of enemies that all behave fairly differently in one way or another, and having to strategize depending on who's closest to you, Popcos instead offers you a slew of enemies that behave completely differently from each other, each with their own unique respective way of preventing them from getting to you. Take One Night Flumpty 2 for example, you're equipped only with a light switch and a pair of vent doors, and while the majority of enemies work fairly differently from one another in terms of how they'll attempt to approach you, they're all able to be stopped through flicking the lights off or toggling the correct vent door. This means you're always strategizing, trying to figure out the best possible option in your line of defense to execute. In turn, this keeps the gameplay varied and enjoyable throughout. Or uh, here's another example, Five Nights at Candies. Your only defense is closing doors, but the variation in how the enemies work changes up the gameplay and makes things fairly interesting throughout. Most notably, some of the robots lacking those glowing eyes forcing you to check the cameras outside the doors, and the animatronic that'll slowly rise from its stand, only to smash through the glass screen in front of you if you miss your cue. While Popco certainly nails the variation in enemies, it almost feels like clockwork trying to get through a night, especially the later ones, and this is likely entirely due to the fact that there's not one overarching defense at your disposal, rather it feels like you're going through a checklist of to-dos that really don't connect in any way. Okay, before you get mad at me, I don't hate this game or the mechanics themselves, they're all pretty solid as far as original fan game mechanics go, but at least from my standpoint, I think they work best when they're threaded together to produce produce a more organic experience that works with itself, rather than just a collection of totally separate distractions. I also feel like Pop Goes as mechanic is a tad flawed in itself too, in the fact that he'll always face the room he's about to enter, which personally I don't fully understand, as surely that removes some of the challenge. I think changing it up so that he's facing a fairly general direction instead forcing you to click around a tad to try and drag him down would have been a tad more engaging. I do like totally get it though, some people really do enjoy this kind of stressful mess of mechanics, and while that's all totally valid in its own right, it's just not really my cup of tea. But hey, after you beat tonight and once a little Pop Goes the Weasel jingle plays, you're taken straight to a mini game closely resembling the ones you play in Five Nights at Freddy's 3. At least that's what the playable characters are styled after. Each night you'll traverse the same map as a different Pop Goes animatronic, Stone, Saffron, Sarah, Blake, and finally Pop Goes in that order. While the map stays the same, the pathway you'll take will change as various walls open and close, guiding you towards a respective toy animatronic stuck in some kind of web. The toy question is always fairly beat up with some bits and pieces of them laying about the path you'll take to reach them. And once you do, well you don't get to see what happens, the minigame cuts out and you're taken straight to the next night. While there's clearly some significance to these minigames, it's hard to deter much, though I will say that the environment you're in looks awfully, uh, organic? Uh, like, like you're wandering through somebody's inside or somebody's brain or something. It's definitely a tad odd, but sort of cool nonetheless. Oh, you do also get some, uh, pretty intriguing little sketches. If you hover over a certain piece of any of the given robots scattered about and tap the spacebar a few times, you'll be brought to one of these. I'm guessing they're like snapshots of the story in a sense, pieces of a puzzle you're expected to put together. But yeah, that's pretty much how the game will play out. New mechanics are introduced each night, you'll get a call from Fritz, survive five nights, son of a bitch. Yeah, the notorious sixth night wouldn't be a fan game without lying about it in the title of the game. Oh. Huh. Night 6 is nothing special. Of course, it's the most challenging main night, but the most notable change here is that Fritz is seemingly worried about a revelation he's just made, asking you if you could trust someone who, while they have made big mistakes in their life, didn't regret it all in the end. You're simply given a yes or no option at the end of the call, with neither having any bearing on any potential endings or scenarios, let alone even another voice message from Fritz. And okay, again, this isn't like a huge difference or nothing. It's a bit of a twist on the previous night's multiple choice answers. Otherwise, the night is the same as usual. Uh, but yeah, beat night six and you'll get a fairly simple ending card, with the Pop Goes gang all lined up in front of, uh, <laughs> what? It's clearly a Stone the Crow reskin, uh, but he's like made of ice or something? Hold a sign telling us to find the truth. Okay, I'm guessing from this alone there's certainly more to this game than what it's offered to us at face value. Though I'm pretty sure I've seen this guy before. Yeah, he appeared in a couple of those minigames and even on the cameras occasionally. I can assume this guy is a little more significant than what's being let on. So once you're taken back to the title screen, you'll unlock access to a slew of extras and unlocks. Character profiles, character room and prop developments, even scrapped concepts with a fair amount of descriptions to accompany, detailing the history behind them. As always, I really dig the behind the 
behind-the-scenes stuff for this sort of thing, especially for fan games. These are, after all, fan passion projects made entirely for free, so to see this much bonus content from the infamous Morse the Mole to a cancelled sequel to even a freaking graphic novel outlining the Popco story is truly really cool. Oh hey, you're able to view the minigame map from here? I don't see why you would... The environment you're in looks awfully, uh, organic? Uh, like, like you're wandering through somebody's inside or somebody's brain or something. <gasps> hey! I don't mind them showing this at all. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny, why don't you perish? Dickhead. So hey, in addition to all that funky stuff, we're also treated to a custom night, or the good night as the game refers to it as, and uh, these guys certainly went all out. You got specific challenge modes, rewards for set modes, even some cheats and bonus challenges with special phone wallpaper unlocks, but beating the main challenge modes with the added difficulty. Uh, one thing I think kind of defeats a bit of replay value here is that said phone wallpapers only appear on custom nights, and you know, having unlockable fine wallpapers is such a cool little concept, and it's kind of a shame that you can't play through the meat of the game with them enabled. Uh, a bit of an obscure example, but kind of like how new Super Mario Brothers would give you touchscreen wallpaper unlocks in return for collecting the game's hidden star coins, and sure enough, you can go back and play through the entire game if you wanted with those enabled. You know, I just think that's a neat extra that went to waste a little here. But hey, speaking of the custom night difficulty modes, being as shit at fan games as I am, I went ahead and beat the toughest vanilla mode on my third try and got absolutely nowhere with any of the challenges applied. Yeah, go motion sucks at fan games, yeah, can't beat five nuts of candies too, 720, yeah, go on, bully me. Yeah, I'll see I'll see you on the comments. <laughs> oh, what's that? You think you're good at Pop Goes Go Motion? No. No, I don't. But hey, is that all of what Pop Goes has to offer? <laughs> no, of course not. Well, okay, before I get into that, you do unlock some interesting little extras in the character profiles menu. These funky metal statues of each animatronic and uh strings? Oh, damn. Yeah, we play as this mechanical friggin' spider thing. I don't even have a joke for this. That's just neat. And hey, that does explain a lot how you're only able to rotate at sharp 90 degree angles, why your panic level is measured by a meter, why your phone flips up and down. Even listening back through the phone calls, they've been intentionally written to serve as a double meaning, both as calls for a human night watchman and for artificial intelligence. And hey, this is another example of Popko's taking a fan theory and converting it into an element of its own canon. While a bit of a less popular theory back in the FNAF 1 days, people thought that you could have been playing as a robot. I mean, sure, it had explained sitting the same 6 hour shift after being threatened with, like, death or whatever. So, on top of the 6 main nights and the custom night challenges, there is also an alternate secret ending to work towards, though it's pretty simple to get to. Just go through the game and die to each enemy, take a screen cap of each one of their game over screens, assume that this number over here translates to the number of seconds you'll have to time yourself from at the beginning of each night before checking the camera here, find this lanky boy, press the corresponding colour on the desk in response to his eye colour, finish the night, play a minigame, gain ultimate sentience, Kill a toy, repeat for five nights, side a black robot on the sixth night, copy down the seconds here in the room here, time yourself for the sixth night, find Lanky Boy again, finish the night, play a mini game, holy shit, change race, kill this dude, damn. Sorry, typo, didn't mean secrets. I meant C convoluted as all hell. Now, okay, okay, yes, this is quite a convoluted method of reaching what is the game's, like, true ending. It would certainly take one person a huge amount of trial and error to even begin to find all this, but that's because Pop Goes was designed to be picked apart by the community that it had built up for itself right up to release. I figured they were going for something similar to the process involved in reaching that secret ending in Five Nights at Freddy's 3. The totally obscure puzzles and collectibles that had people tearing the game apart to reach that was also entirely intended as a community effort, and while due to some unfortunate circumstances the same didn't end up happening for Bob Goes, all the pieces were certainly in place for something like that to have been possible. The idea was for people to share their own screenshots and experiences, for example, one person finds any one of the robot's respective death screens, somebody notices the code in the top left, somebody else experiments with the data and fails, another person figures out what to do with said data and succeeds, one person manages to find the strange purple skeleton dude and the cameras in response to said data. It was all built with the community in mind. While you could call this fairly ambitious, this is a very cool idea, especially for a fan game that not many people knew very much about in the grand scheme of things beforehand, yet had a pretty sizable following regardless, and you know, it really is a shame that things didn't go to plan. A lot of the game's secrets were leaked fairly quickly on its release day, but had that not happened, I have no doubt it would have been a very similar situation to Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Speaking of that game though, this is just one of the ways that that specific core Freddy's game influenced Pop Goes. While I mentioned the FNAF 3-esque minigames, another good example is Pop Goes' building Black Rabbit mechanic. There was a popular theory around the build-up to Freddy's 3 concerning this teaser here, that Springtrap would build an animatronic to 
go after you from the box of parts. While of course that never did end up happening, despite how strangely significant this teaser made the box out to be, the idea of an animatronic being built right then and there during the night was carried over into Popgoes. It's little things like that that you gotta just sit back and appreciate, taking a concept that so many fans latched onto and actually doing something interesting with it. And not only that, but to give it a twist such as not simply shoving robot parts together, rather 3D printing them is... Uh... <laughs> Uh, it's just freaking cool, man. I mean, the entire concept of all these animatronics being 3D printed is honestly such a rad idea. And so is the premise of the Pop Goes Pizzeria itself being a hub of sorts for kids to come along and print their own figurines. Again, it's taking a functional in-universe purpose and translating it into a unique game mechanic. But now you might be asking yourself why are the 3D printers spread out across several rooms in the building? And how are they possibly printing life-size animatronic suit parts so quickly? That doesn't seem very realistic. And to that I say, this plastic rabbit is level Levitating. But hey, what the bitch am I rambling on about, right? It's it's game time. So hey, the card you get for finally reaching this ending is uh, definitely something. The animatronics are all grey with white glowing joints. Stone's been turned into a... Gravestone. And this spooky ass skeleton we keep seeing on the cameras. But uh, rest in peace, Jeremy Fitzgerald? Okay, so, Fritz is Jeremy Fitzgerald. W what? How? Yeah, it do be. Now this game being as lore heavy as it is combined with me trying to keep this review as focused mainly on the gameplay side of things as possible means that there is a lot here that I'm not discussing with the way anybody could reach this conclusion included. And hey, you can interpret anything you like from this. For example, does this mean Fritz is dead? Well, yeah, probably. Hey, I am not here to explain all that. Find the truth. Yeah. Now, upon beating this ending, you're granted access to a few extra character unlocks. Uh, Simon, Lux, Animatronics, and Gravestone. With some extra descriptions detailing just who these mofos really are. Oh, and hey, looking through the character profiles again... Gravestone and... Okay, Gemstone. Yes, very cute. Two birds, one stone. Again, this isn't just wordplay for the sake of wordplay, but it's cleverly integrated nonetheless. Having Gemstone, a physically transparent character, representing this idea of transparency and, like, nothing being wrong, and having Gravestone, the opposite, an opaque character representing what's really going on. And speaking of wordplay, this dude being named Simon makes all this make a whole lot more sense. That Simon Says minigame that is essentially what Blake's mechanic is, well, here you are doing literally, as Simon Says, copying the colors that appear in his eyes on the camera. And hey, speaking of appear, Runts. Pop Goes definitely has one. This game visually has a fairly strong aesthetic. Everything from the UI to the main night segments all seep this futuristic, technologically advanced, almost industrial aura, even featuring a cool white color temperature to tie together the environment. I don't know, dude, it almost gives the place like a cold late night vibe, which should, you know, make sense. After all, Fritz does mention in the phone calls that they're entering the winter time and, you know, it's also the middle of the night. And while it's not too far off from Freddy's 2's visual style, like I mentioned earlier, it's almost like it's been tweaked just enough to give it its own identity. Each room is appropriately decorated and colourful enough in its own right, nothing feels overpopulated with props, the lighting in some rooms is very on point, it's all generally very well designed. And hey, speaking of designs, the robots sure do have them, and for the most part, these are all fairly solid, reminiscent of the toy animatronics of course. However, there are a few design choices that never really sat well with me, most notably the oversized foreheads on Popcos and Blake, as well as the choice to not extrude the bellies of the animatronics, you know, the way the toy animatronics have exactly that. Weird. I also think Stone is pretty bland in the grand scheme of things, he does hold that bright red sign, but aside from that, it is a very basic looking bird, there is nothing going on at all really. But hey, I certainly think that both Strings and Simon are very neat looking models. Simon is this deep purple Terminator looking ass and he's just tall enough for it to be a little unsettling. Especially through that cutscene you get for beating that secret ending, that's one hell of a cool little moment. We don't see much of Strings of course, but as far as curiosity bots go, uh, yeah. You could do worse. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's uh, one element across each one of the character models here that's a bit... Uh, Oily. Yeah, I don't know what was going on here, but instead of making the animatronics look and feel like matte plastic, the modeler opted to go with this... Oh gosh, I don't even know. It's it's like this waxy looking oily kind of deal. It's super difficult to describe, it, and it's not like a huge blemish or nothing. 
but in some renders they just don't look that great. <laughs> Thankfully all the models were totally revamped and given updated and far more accurate materials to reflect that of these guys being 3D printed after the game's release for the now cancelled Pogos remake. The difference is night and day and not only do these guys now look like they're genuinely 3D printed, but the vertex assigned texturing issues on some of these guys have been totally fixed with far more segmented pieces to give these guys a look further reminiscent of what they're meant to represent. Popgo still has those strange pokey corners on his forehead, yeah I never knew what was up with that. But hey, while that remake was cancelled, a full on reboot of the entire series was announced on April 1st of this year, yeah, Popgo's 2020 edition, as some kind of anti April Fools joke or something, with the promise of totally redesigned animatronics, and I'm fairly intrigued to see what gets changed and messed with this time around. But hey, that is pretty much the majority of what's here to cover, and certainly one of the most intriguing fan games I've looked at, and honestly, I can safely say it's not bad at all. While I definitely think the game's flawed in a few areas, I have to say that for the most part, it's a fan game that really holds up, and it's still a good time if you're up for some anxiety-inducing multitasking. The presentation is definitely on point, and fairly consistent from the teasers, the game itself, even a very enthusiastic trailer. It all exhibits this quick-paced, snappy digital atmosphere. It has its own identity, and pulls a lot of unique concepts from that to build what is, in turn, a very unique tribute, and doesn't forget to shake in those extra little experiences. For example, if you go back to those same cameras at the correct times, instead of seeing Simon, you'll see a Lux animatronic, pushing that replayability just a little more. And while I hardly covered much of it at all in this review, there is a lot to this game story. And while, you know, fan game lore isn't everyone's thing, if you're at all interested in digging deeper into a story you can solve on your own, there is a ton of material to sift through to really figure out what's going on. This game also just does a lot of things to counter the norm. Uh, one good example, as I discussed, starting the animatronics off right beside you. That sure did get a couple of Let's Players at least. And in that regard, you know, I feel like there are a few areas where that may have backfired a bit, like requiring you to listen really close to the phone calls to figure out how some of the mechanics work for yourself. While that's a neat idea, most players will be going into this expecting the mechanics to be explained to them at face value, kind of like most other fan games. And while Popcos does do a fair amount right, I feel like it lacks a tad in making things obvious enough for people more used to how phone calls in these things usually work. But overall, this is a really solid fan game, everything from the visuals to the punchy and satisfying sound design to the gameplay mechanics, Popcos isn't a perfect fan game, there's quite a bit about it, I'm looking forward to seeing tweaks in the upcoming reboot, but for the most part, it's a fun time, so would I recommend this? I'd say give it a go if you're feeling it. While not everyone will get a kick out of it, there's still a lot to be liked and appreciated here. So uh, hey, give it a download, give it a play, and we'll just have to wait for the reboot to see how Kane handles the game a second time.